Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to present today, and thanks for everybody who uh, made it out uh, this morning. It is my uh, disclosure, is nothing that should uh, affect what I say today. You know, PEC tubes haven't changed a lot. First introduced back in the uh, 1800s, and then uh, the first PEG performed by uh, Dr. Ponsky back in 1997, uh, sorry, 1979. Not a whole lot has, has changed in the sort of the basic technique, and uh, I'll, I'll speak about that. And then in the early uh, uh, 1980s, uh, uh, radiologic uh, uh, intral tubes uh, started. Uh, I'm, uh, I do part of my work in interventional radiology, so I thought I'd change the talk a little bit and talk a little bit about the radiology uh, type insertion and a little bit about the endoscopic insertion, and hopefully you'll uh, find some use in that. So the indications, uh, everybody knows, any type of uh, neurological compromise where the swallowing me mechanism is, is not working or if they have an anatomic issue where they, where they can't swallow. When you're uh, trying to pick which type of ventral axis you're gonna, where you're gonna choose, uh, you should uh, um, uh, keep this in mind. If there's any uh, sort of anatomic abnormality that puts the patient at high risk of aspiration, maybe a PEC tube is not the, the best option, then you can look at the other options either a jejunostomy insertion or a GJ tube insertion to try and uh, decrease the risk of aspiration. And then obviously the other side of, uh, of these uh, tubes is for decompression, so either for a gastric outlet obstruction or uh, in patients who have uh, uh, small bowel, malignant small bowel obstructions that are, are palliative and you, you may want to do just a venting type uh, gastrostomy tube. Contraindications, I would say really only the, the first two are absolute uh, contraindications. Uh, you know, ascites, peritoneal carcinomatosis, I would say are, are relative contraindications. And I'll show you uh, a couple of uh, examples of patients with a sort of severe uh, peritoneal carcinomatosis where we're still able to get enteral access. And then interposed organs is really a safety issue. You just need to uh, uh, be mindful of that. And is, uh, I'll, I'll show how uh, you can avoid injuring the colon. So like I said, there's a lot of ways of getting uh, enteral access. You should really think how long the patient will need it. If it's really just an issue of uh, a week or two of, uh, of a nutritional support, then maybe a temporary uh, natural orifice access, an NG tube, an NG tube might be sufficient. Otherwise, if they need a more permanent solution, then uh, we all obviously have the PEC tube. But you can either do it open, laparoscopic, or what we talk about today is the percutaneous access, either endoscopic or image-guided. So the um, endoscopic uh, PEC tubes technique hasn't really changed, as I said, in the last 40 years. You're going to get a scope down into the uh, stomach, visualize the anterior wall of the stomach. You can press uh, on the outside to see where you're indenting the stomach. Some, some, some people like to use a, a finder needle to see exactly where you're going to access. Um, I don't tend to do that. Uh, just uh, use the needle from your, from your kit. To, uh, to get in. If you're going to use the uh, pull type, uh, then you're going to pass a little wire loop through. Uh, otherwise, uh, with the push type, there's a, just a, a regular uh, guide wire that will go through. On the inside, you're going to grab it, snare it, and pull it out. Uh, and then once you have uh, through and through access uh, through the abdomen, you're basically going to load it. So if you have a, a wire loop, it will pass through the uh, loop on the other on the side of the uh, uh, tube, and then it will all pass through. It self dilates, so the, uh, the the tube is very tapered, very sorry stiff uh, stiff leading edge. Uh, it takes a little bit of force sometimes to to get it through. Um, and then there's a little mushroom cap that's going to be on the inside. I typically like to go back in endoscopically to look that there's not, not too much uh, um, uh, force that you're applying on the stomach and not too much tension on it. We definitely have seen some ulcerations uh, on the underside of this uh, mushroom cap. And then on the outside, you have this plastic uh, uh, bumper. Um, what I like to do is uh, just have it on very, very slight tension. Uh, hopefully, that way you can avoid some of the uh, risk of a, a buried uh, bumper um, uh, and, uh, and ulcerations or the tube pulling, pulling right out. So I like to have it kind of sitting out of the, on the skin and then if you just apply a little bit of force, it, it separates. And that's what I find uh, that, uh, that helps the most. Uh, the radiological type access, I think if you have easy access, I mean we do, I would say the vast, vast majority of our enteral access now in the radiology department is almost 
no PEG tubes uh, being put endoscopically uh, in in, uh, in our institution uh, unless it's for sort of special special situations. Uh, it's easy, relatively easy and quick. Uh, a lot of it is just uh, a regular Seldinger technique, and you really don't need to be an interventional radiologist if you have access to a C arm. Uh, you can uh, easily do it yourself. Uh, just put an NG tube down. Obviously, a lot of these patients already have an NG tube. Really inflate the stomach. Aim somewhere around the uh, uh, mid body of the stomach. You're gonna. I'll show you some pictures in a second. You'll see the transverse colon very well. Uh, get a needle in, a little bit of contrast, and then just Selnigar technique. Uh, a lot of the tubes that we used to put in would be regular uh, uh, pigtail tubes. They might be a little bit less secure because you're just relying on the, the pigtail itself to lock it in place. So that's why we sort of switch to a balloon retention G-tube that you can also put in percutaneously. So as I said, uh, stomach is going to be nicely inflated with air. You can see the transverse colon is below it. Aim towards the mid-body to, uh, and then with your puncture, aim towards the fundus. And then once you're in, get your wire in, curl it up in the fundus. Uh, a couple of dilators to get in place. A little bit of air will leak out of the stomach as you as you dilate, really of no consequence. Um, and then the kit comes with a, a little sheath that you can get in. I would get the sheath way into the stomach so that as a little bit of air uh, comes out of the stomach when you do the exchanges, you won't fall out. Uh, and then finally, you put in the tube. Uh, it has a little bit of, uh, it has a balloon at the tip of it. You just inflate it, and that gives you a, a secure access. Now, injury to surrounding structures is one of the main main uh, risks of placing these PEG tubes. Uh, injury to the transverse colon, I would say, is the is the biggest risk. The transverse colon will a lot of times end up sitting right in front of your stomach. Uh, there's a couple of maneuvers that you can do endoscopically to try and avoid it. Uh, obviously, transilluminating if the patient is thin enough that you can actually see through their abdominal wall uh, is is quite helpful. Uh, and then palpation, uh, you're looking for this kind of one to one motion. I'd say. You know, it might be hard to know exactly what's one-to-one. -one. Uh, so some people might use a little 25-gauge needle or a little finder needle to pass it through. And then what you're looking is to see as you're aspirating, to see if you're getting air at the same time that you're accessing the lumen of the stomach. If you're getting air before you're accessing the lumen of the stomach, then you might be puncturing through the transverse colon. Again, just to show you fluoroscopically what, what it looks like. So this is a, a snap. The snap is at the same same position. We haven't moved it on the skin. You can see uh, the transverse colon is sitting up uh, right in front of the stomach. And uh, here, as you're inflating the stomach with, uh, with uh, the nasogastric tube, you can really push the transverse colon down. So I would say that air is, is your friend when you're doing these, uh, these procedures. Really distend the stomach well. Try and move everything out of the way. And even at times where it looks like the colon is interfering. Once you get the stomach distended enough, it will move out. So I think there's there's advantages and disadvantages to either the endoscopic option or the, the radiological option. I'd say the radiological option it may, uh, is maybe not as secure at times. The, the tube can get dislodged, especially if you're using the pigtail uh, type. If you're using the, uh, if you're using the um, balloon type, it's, it's a bit more secure. I'd say probably just as secure as, as the mushroom type pec tube. Uh, and then for, if you're doing a purely endoscopic place, uh, placement, then, you know, issues such as a colon interposition, ascites, uh, avoiding, uh, shunts, patients who are morbidly obese can become, can become an issue. So, uh, you know, I think if you're having, uh, if you're doing them endoscopically for the most part, if you have a specifically challenging patient, then having a C-arm, uh, in place could, could really help you. There's been over the years a couple of studies that tried to compare the radiological uh, approach and the uh, and the endoscopic approach. So it depends a little bit on who you believe. There's a meta-analysis uh, on the, in the radiology literature from '95 showing that the uh, radiological uh, insertion is a bit safer. Uh, and uh, from uh, uh, more recent one uh, in the gastroenterology literature showing that they're about the same, with maybe a slight advantage for endoscopic uh, placement in patients with uh, head and neck uh, uh, tumors. I would say gastropexies and T fasteners are um, uh, sort of still a question, uh, an open question. We don't uh, use them routinely, but uh, if you have a specifically challenging patient, you can use it. Just going to move just to a couple cases just to show you how this might be useful. So this is a patient with a chronic motility issue. He's not obstructed. This is what he looks like usually. Uh, we were asked to try and get enteral access in this patient. Obviously, the transverse colon is 
you know, hiding the whole uh, left upper quadrant. Uh, so uh, what what we did in this patient is we got a, a flex sig up there up to the transverse colon and just manually uh, uh, decompressed them, sucked out the whole uh, uh, transverse colon, uh, and then and then once you sucked it out, uh, you inflated the stomach. It gives you a nice uh, easy access uh, into the stomach, and you could put in a pec tube. That's kind of a nice a nice. Uh, uh, endoscopic option in, in some patients. This is, uh, like I was saying before, ascites and, and kind of peritoneal carcinomatosis, I'd say, are relative contraindications. This is a patient with uh, um, uh, just mucinous deposits all over the abdomen. Again, we were asked to, uh, to put in uh, uh, enteral access. Uh, the stomach, you see, is entirely encased with, with mucin. Uh, and luckily enough, on CT, we were able to just find a little patch at a couple of centimeters of exposed uh, stomach that uh, we could get a, a pec tube into it. Fluoroscopy, I think, is also, there's a whole other talk on J-tubes, so I won't really uh, go into it, but uh, I really like it when I do uh, J-tubes, uh, especially with a cross-table lateral. You can see that your lupa bowel is right up against the abdominal wall. You can easily puncture into it under endoscopic and fluoroscopic access, and, uh, and then go ahead and, and place your G-tubes. So that's it for my talk. Thank you very much.